At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row One catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row One Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to award-winning Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. We are bringing old-school basketball to a new-school audience. And today, we bring you the story of the first two seven-foot superstars, George Mikan and Bob Curland. Now, if you have listened to this show for a while, then you know that the name George Mikan pops up with some regularity since he was one of the greatest players of all time and the NBA's first superstar in the late 1940s and early 1950s. In 1950, the Associated Press decided to name the best player in each sport for the first half of the 20th century. For example, they named Babe Ruth the greatest baseball player for the first half of the 20th century. Now, as part of the same effort, they named George Mikan as the greatest player in basketball history and gave him the nickname Mr. Basketball. And Mikan loved that nickname so much that he even titled his autobiography Mr. Basketball. Now, up until George Mikan, most players that came anywhere close to seven feet tall did not bring a lot of skill to the game. They were only tall. But Mikan actually brought a high level of athleticism to the game, and that is what made him such a deadly player. Now, I am not going to pretend that Mikan's athleticism is anywhere near what we see today with Giannis, or Wembanyama, or even Nikola Jokic. But for his day, Mikan was athletic, at least more athletic than all the previous seven-footers. And he won an NIT title while playing for DePaul University in Chicago. He then won a championship with the Lakers while playing for the National Basketball League, or NBL. Then, the entire Lakers team jumped to a new league that we now know as the NBA, and he won five more championships with those Lakers teams. But this episode is not just a profile on George Mikan, no. This episode is about the college rivalry of Mikan and another player by the name of Bob Curlin. In the three years of doing this podcast, I have mentioned the name Bob Curlin maybe once or twice, but I want to share more of his story. Bob Curlin was truly seven feet tall, as opposed to Mikan, who was a hair over six foot ten. But at the time that Mikan joined the NBA, he was the tallest player in league history. Bob Curlin never played in the NBA, and I will share why by the end of this episode. Both Mikan and Curlin played their college basketball at the same time as each other. Mikan, who is from the Chicago area, ended up at DePaul University. Curlin was from Missouri and really wanted to attend the University of Missouri, but all they could offer him was a job to help him pay his way through school. However, Hall of Fame coach Hank Iba offered Curlin a full scholarship to go to Oklahoma A&M University. Now that school is known today as Oklahoma State. Now Curlin could not pass up a full scholarship. It would allow him to become the first member of his family to attend and graduate from college. Now these two athletic big men were considered the two best players in college at the time that they played. In fact, for the three years that they played on their respective varsity teams, they won all of the National Player of the Year awards. Mikan won the National Player of the Year award during their sophomore and junior seasons in 1944 and 1945. Curlin won the National Player of the Year award during their senior season in 1946. Now, both players were named first team All-American for all three years that they played on the varsity, and this was a natural rivalry. Two elite big men winning all of the awards and accolades that college basketball had to offer for three straight years. They were like the college version of Bill Russell versus Will Chamberlain. 
They both had banner years as juniors in 1945. Curlin led his Oklahoma State team to the NCAA championship. Meanwhile, George Mikan led his DePaul team to the NIT championship, which at the time was considered the more prestigious of the two tournaments. In 1946, Curlin was able to lead his team to a second NCAA championship. Unfortunately for Mikan, he was not able to win a second championship with DePaul. But as far as college basketball was concerned, these two players dominated the headlines. Both players were incredibly effective on defense, but then there were no goaltending rules in that day. This meant that a defensive player could swat a ball away while it was on its downward trajectory toward the basket. Mikan and Curlin were known to camp out under the basket and then just swat away or catch any ball that came anywhere near the basket. It was practically impossible to score against them with goaltending being legal back then. And it was because of these specific two players that the rules were changed by introducing the modern goaltending rule. A defensive player can no longer touch a ball while it is on its downward trajectory toward the basket. If the defensive player interferes with such a ball, the penalty is that the basket counts for the shooting team. And that significantly reduced the defensive effectiveness of these two players and increased scoring. And increased scoring always sells tickets. Now these two players did play each other five times during their three years on the varsity. And Mikan held an edge of three games to one as they entered the fifth and final matchup before they both graduated from college. They were playing a benefit game to raise money for the Red Cross, and putting Mikan and Curlin against each other to raise money was a genius move. Now, Mikan fouled out of the game after only 14 minutes. His DePaul team was leading 21 to 14 at the time that Mikan had fouled out. But without Mikan on the court, Oklahoma State came roaring back and won the game 52 to 44. Without Mikan there for defense, Curlin was able to throw down several dunks. Now, this is important because very few players would dunk back in the 1940s. Partly, it was that players were generally not athletic enough to actually dunk the ball, and partly because it was frowned upon as showing up the other team. In other words, it was considered bad etiquette to dunk on your opponent. The layup was the preferred shot from point-blank range. Regardless, Curlin threw down several dunks to the great amazement and wonder of the crowd. The Oklahoma State fans just loved it. It was such an aggressive move, and relatively few fans had ever seen a dunk in competition. So that was really the start of the dunk as a shot in the college ranks. However, as college ended for these two players, it was time to move on to the next level, and here is where their two careers diverged significantly. And I will share that story when we come back. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Welcome back to the show and let us continue with the story of the rivalry between George Mikan and Bob Curlin. As I mentioned before the break, these two players dominated college basketball for the three years that they both played on their respective varsity teams. They collected championships and all three College Player of the Year awards during their three-year stretch. But it was time to graduate and move on to the next thing. But this is where they went in very different directions. George Mikan decided to sign on with a team called the Chicago American Gears, and this was when corporate basketball was still a thing. So let me explain what corporate basketball was. There were teams that were directly sponsored and supported by a company and typically carried the name of the supporting company. The players were in part regular company employees who also played on the company-sponsored basketball team. In the case of George Mikan, he was paid to work in the company's legal department as he he was studying for his law degree, which he earned the following year, but he was also paid to play on the basketball team. The company was called the Chicago American Gear Company, which is why the team was called the Chicago American Gears. The team was essentially an extension of the company's marketing department. The better the team performed, the more exposure and advertising the company received. In fact, the Detroit Pistons also started out as a company team back in the 1940s. They were owned by the Zollner Piston Company out of Fort Wayne, Indiana. Fred Zollner was the owner of the company and his basketball team was supposed to be part of the advertising efforts. That is why the original name of the team was the Fort Wayne Zollner Pistons. Now, when the team was sold to the new owners who relocated them to Detroit, 
is that's when they became simply the Detroit Pistons. Now, let's get back to Mikan and the American Gears. After just one season with the American Gears, the owner of the company felt that the team was costing too much money to support and they were not getting the advertising return that they were wanting. So they shut the team down, despite the fact that in 1947, they were the league champions. As for Mike, well, he was also out of a job. The reason they hired him was not so much for his legal work, but for the fact that he was the best player in America. That is when Mike accepted an offer to become the new center for the Minneapolis Lakers. The rest, as they say, is history. He would win six championships with the Lakers, one in the old NBL, which no longer exists, and five in the NBA. Now, as a Lakers fan, I wish we could count that one NBL championship. It would mean that the Lakers would have 18 championships instead of the 17 that they are credited with in the NBA. Anyway, Bob Curlin took a very different path with his basketball career. He took a job in sales for the Phillips Petroleum Company out of Oklahoma, and they were best known for their chain of gas stations or petrol stations if you are from the UK. Their stations were called Phillips 66, so the company basketball team was called the Phillips 66ers. But this was not a professional team like the American Gears where Mike and played. Bob Curlin was only paid for his work as a salesperson for the company. He played on the basketball team completely for free, and that was a way that he was able to keep his amateur status. In fact, the entire team was considered amateur. The Phillips 66ers did not compete in any professional league. They competed in the American Athletic Union or AAU, which is an amateur organization. It was very common for some company teams to field an amateur team as part of their marketing strategy unlike the Chicago American Gears, who competed in professional leagues and the players were clearly paid for their basketball skills. Now, back in the 1940s, the AAU still had an adult men's division. These teams typically fielded squads of former Division I basketball players, and the Phillips 66ers were one of the strongest amateur teams in the country, especially when they landed Bob Curlin. So why would Curlin play on an amateur team after graduating college instead of playing for a professional team like Mike? did. Partly it was because the money that Curlin made in sales was not that far off from what a professional basketball player made back in the NBL. In the 1940s, professional basketball salaries were nowhere near what they are today. A typical professional basketball player made a fairly comfortable middle class salary, and even then, the player would almost certainly have a second job that they worked in the off season for extra money. But for Curlin, it was important to keep his amateur status. You see, he had his sights on playing in the Olympics. The 1944 Olympics were canceled because of World War II, or else he most certainly would have made the United States team. By keeping his amateur status, he was able to go in 1948 to the London Olympics and help the United States win a gold medal. And he returned to the Olympics in 1952 for the Helsinki Games and won another gold medal. Now, none of that would have been possible had he played in a professional league like Mikan. Curlin was the beast of the AAU circuit. He led the 66ers to three AAU national championships in 1947, 1948, and 1950. He was named an AAU All-American for all six years that he played on the AAU circuit. It was a different path for sure, but a very viable one. He gave up basketball due to his work commitments, and <laughs> what happened was he was starting to get promoted within the company and had to take on more work responsibility. You see, Curlin stayed with the Phillips Petroleum Company even after he retired from basketball because it turns out he was was actually a very strong business executive and he rose all the way to a vice president role with that company before retiring from work altogether in 1985. In the end, Mikan is the more well-known player because of his time in the NBA and the championships that he won. Mikan would later open up his own law firm and he would also be the first commissioner of the ABA and even ran for Congress in Minnesota, although he lost. Now, Curlin pursued his business career and was extremely successful at it. Mikan was enshrined in the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame in 1959 and Bob Curlin would join him 
in 1961. But for those three years that they were both playing varsity college basketball in the 1940s, they were the two biggest names in basketball. They played in a day when college basketball was far more popular than professional basketball. And if you were a basketball fan back in the 1940s, then you definitely knew the names of Mikan and Curlin. They literally changed the game by forcing rules to be changed due to their dominance on the defensive end. You know how some basketball players are described as changing the game or revolutionizing the game? Typically, the person is simply trying to describe a player with incredible gifts, and that's fine. But when basketball has to start changing its rules specifically because of a certain player, then that is literally changing the game. The goaltending rules exist today specifically because of Mikan and Curlin. Later, the three second lane was widened from six feet to 12 feet specifically because of George Mikan. That again is changing the game. And we can give credit to both Mikan and Curlin and we are all better for it and so is the game. So that is it for today. Why don't you join us next week when we share the story of the history of the National Basketball League or NBL, which we mentioned in this episode. We will take a closer look at that league and the teams from that league that still exist today. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. And check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories in the past. Take care and see you soon. Hello, sports history fans. I'm Ross from the podcast Pigskin Tales. You're about to jump into another thrilling sports history moment, but first, let's dive into today's sponsor, just in time for the holiday season. Introducing Art of Words, the brainchild of word artist Dan Duffy from Philadelphia. Dan meticulously crafts stunning images by handwriting relevant words from some of the greatest sports moments in time. These unique budget-friendly illustrations are the perfect gift Sparking cherished memories and capturing hearts. Choose from city skylines, sports, history, and musicians to find a piece for everyone. And here's the exciting part. For that sports fanatic in your life, gift them a piece of their favorite team or player's history. Art of Words tells a compelling story. Explore collegiate stadiums, each meticulously crafted with every football victory etched into words. Or venture into baseball stadiums, handwritten with every player from the team's illustrious history. My favorite on the site is Bryce Harper 2021 MVP year. Because I'm a big stats guy, I think that's one of the coolest things ever. Check it out! Don't wait! Order a print today for yourself and your loved one this holiday season. Transform your wall into a gallery of captivating art and surprise your family and friends with a print of their own. Use code SHN15 at artofwords.com for a 15% discount on your order in November and December. Visit Art of Words, where words magically transform into stunning art, evoking cherished memories and touching the hearts of those who you care about. Again, use the code SHN15 for 15% off at artofwords.com.